we're very excited about the agenda for this year's Rail Policy Forum, especially about this first session, which is intended to set the tone and direction for the rest of today's program. In this session, we, are, we will receive updates from across the U.S. on those developments that are truly transformational in moving America's passenger rail system toward the tipping point when world-class high-speed service will regularly and frequently operate in the United States. We have three panelists to share uh, with us those transformative updates. Chad Edison, uh, Deputy uh, Secretary of the California Transportation Agency. Beth Mikulski, uh, Director of the Office of Intermodal Project Implementation for the Illinois Department of Transportation and Chair of the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission. And Caroline Decker, Amtrak's Vice President, Government Affairs and um, Corporate Communication. As Anna mentioned, their biographies are in the program, so you can read those at your leisure. We will start um, with a brief presentation from each of our panelists. Then we will have a round robin discussion about what they said and didn't say in their presentations. And then we will close out the session with a period of questions and answers from the audience. So please take copious notes so that you can ask insightful questions. I will also make a note that um, Chad will have to leave us shortly after his presentation, but Kyle Gredinger uh, will step in to um, help us uh, address the questions and answers with regard to um, the issues and subjects that uh, Chad addresses in his presentation. So with that, Chad will go first, then Beth, and then Caroline. Thank you. We're really excited in California about the future of rail and transit, and uh, really this is um, all about the people. It's all about the passengers that are going to use the systems. It's about improving their lives. It's about uh, improving the environment and improving our communities. So uh, what I'm going to speak to today is uh, really drawn from our draft state rail plan, which is um, out on the street for public comment right now through December 11th, and then will be finalized in the first part of next year um, in 2018. Um, what we've embarked on in California is really a comprehensive statewide network-driven look at what we can do with rail and transit comprehensively. So this is not just um, inner city trains or high-speed trains. It's really how the whole system fits together, how people can move seamlessly from one part of the state to the other, and, and, and some of the kinds of investments that don't, don't necessarily rise, rise to the top if you're only looking at one system at a time. And so, um, I'll give you a quick summary of it, and then you know clearly there'll be questions later. Um, in California today, we have we have uh, five commuter rail systems and three inner city rail routes that are that are within the state, and then we have our long distance trains. We also have the high speed rail system that we're working on, and uh, and, and and so in in the high, in the state rail plan, we really focused on um, how to how to integrate our our network for the for the um, successful movement of people and goods. Um, to benefit the state of California. I'll focus mostly on the passenger vision here because of, because of the, the emphasis on that, but I also want to reassure you that we have a lot of benefits for freight and goods movement, and that's a very imp important part and often a co-benefit of many of our investments in our passenger corridors. Um, the, we, we started with really a focus on the, the longer term, on, on what, 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 what can we be by 2040. And uh, the vision there really focused on a statewide system that, that tied urban, suburban, and rural areas together, true integration of service so that connections were easy um, between rail, express bus, and, and transit, um, schedule coordination in a manner that really reduced the wait times and allowed for very convenient direct transfers. Uh, frequent service so that you could get pretty much from anywhere to anywhere in California every 30 to 60 minutes, in some places even more often than that, both on a statewide level and then within regions on, on, on the more frequent uh, basis. And then a customer focus. Um, the plan is not just about rolling stock and construction, it's about offering one-stop ticketing, scheduling passenger information, offering the entire experience to the passenger. 
So we focused on network schedule, fare system. These are some of the things that we talk about a lot in the plan. And um, I, I want to give just one example here going over to Europe um, to, to help explain it. When we look at what integration can look like kind of at a station level. And um, so I'll take you first to this um, small town, 25,000 people in the, in the suburbs of, of, of Zurich. Um, and, uh, and, and what happens there every, every 30 minutes um, throughout, throughout the day. Um, at this station, we have three different regional rail lines and 12 bus lines that all connect. Um, this happens every, every half hour. Um, and they have, uh, they have designed this, uh, this, this, this station to be very efficient in, in, in handling this flow of, 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 of uh, passengers. The, uh, every every uh, half an hour, you have the buses arrive in advance of the train from the 12 different lines. You, you then have the trains arriving in the station from, from the different uh, directions. In many cases, stations in Switzerland have single track on all sides of them um, as, as they come in because they've designed the pulse to be efficient in the use of infrastructure. Um, so the, the, various, the various trains come through the station. They're then all there at the same time, and the trains depart, and finally the buses depart. And this is repeated every 30 minutes at this particular location. So in, in, the, in the state rail plan, we, we, we have designed many of these points on the system, primarily where we have rail to rail uh, connections or rail to long, longer distance bus connections. But we then see many of our, of our nodes on the system having the local transit systems really benefit from having, having that regular pattern of service um, at, at, the, at the stations that have the longer distance trains coming into them. The, the outcome of the, of the rail plan <coughs> is pretty dramatic. When we look at the network as a whole that we're proposing for the state, we have, um, we have uh, from a, a little over 100,000 riders a day on our commuter and inner city rail systems today. We expect by 2040 to be carrying over 1.3 million trips a day. Um, this is a pretty dramatic change in rail mode share. Um, this, is, this is excluding the local transit trips. This is the commuter, inner city, and high-speed rail system going from 0.3% of all of the travel in the state on a daily basis to almost 7%. Um, as a result, we see a major contribution towards the state's future mobility needs, almost a third of the future growth and demand being met by the rail system over the next, over the next 23, 23, 24 years. Just as a, a little bit of kind of uh, graphical data, which um, takes a little explanation, but we, uh, as we looked at the ridership on the system, we looked at what, what it meant to connect the counties of the state. And what you see here is kind of the status quo. If we were just to grow with demographics, what would our, what would our ridership flow look like from county to county? These are the counties of California roughly arranged from north to south. And when we, when we put together our network, statewide network, we ended up with dramatically more connectivity. You can see how much more connected the state is. And, and, um, and, and this, is, this, is, uh, this really makes a difference in how we think about the different segments of our system. Uh, many, many lines um, in the state that would have had a, a certain level of ridership on them um, if they were just designed for their own internal needs, maybe, maybe the peninsula having 100,000 riders a day on it or more. Many of those corridors double or more in their ridership um, when they're put, put into the network. And so that was one of our lessons, some of them much more than that, but, but um, our, our busiest corridors have a dramatic increase in ridership when they're well interfaced with other services. Our overall strategy was to first look at 2040 and to do our visioning at that level, um, and then to come back and say, what do we think we can work on in the, in the first 10 years of, of the plan? We also have a, a four-year program of projects. These are largely the things that are already funded, that are under construction, that are going to be complete by 2022. So our, our state rail plan kind of looks at it from two angles. It says what's already in the works and how are we going to make sure we use that in a way that makes sense in the, in the, in the long-term network, and then what does our 2040 vision look like? Overall, um, here's the map. That's our draft map of the rail system. You'll see that there are not specific operators called out on this system. We have, we have, uh, we have rail services, we have in integrated express bus services, and we have corridors that, have, that are either high speed over 125 miles an hour or, or, or at conventional speeds under 125 miles an hour. Um, the whole system is focused on uh, multimodal connections at key hubs, and it's auto and air competitive throughout the state. 
Overall, in the 2022 timeframe, we focus on our plan and committed projects, um, kind of making some, some, some initial investments in integrated ticketing. Um, and then by 2027, really uh, starting to have our initial high-speed rail services um, using, using our existing capacity that's been programmed um, on, on various uh, freight corridors where we already have agreements to uh, increase service and, uh, and, and, and starting to make some of our key, uh, our key corridor investments. By 2040, that's where the, the, the biggest investments are present. You have a, um, a focus on a new Transbay tube across the bay uh, between San Francisco and Oakland that allows us to tie Sacramento service into the peninsula. And, um, and, and we have a number of other investments throughout the state. We have an emphasis on regional rail systems, like on the Central Coast and in the Central Valley, where, where shorter distance trips tied into the long distance routes um, will we'll, uh, we'll, we'll allow those communities to benefit as well. Uh, Finally, on the, in terms of the details of the plan, one of our focuses is really what it takes to provide a more productive system. And we, we find that, uh, that, that there's a real opportunity as we make these investments and as we get more and denser and denser services on our lines to drive our operating and maintenance costs down significantly. Um, we, we've, we've seen a number of good models for this um, as these kinds of investments have taken place in Europe and as they've been proposed for places in the United States and Canada. And, uh, and, and, and the, the emphasis is on the, the, the major factors here, changing, in, changing your rolling stock, your speed, your turnaround time, travel distances, having more, more trains use the same corridor. And um, overall, as we looked at our, at our opportunities here, we, we see the uh, cost per uh, train mile coming down by an average of about 45% and our cost per seat mile dropping by about 65%. And, and this is a major um, element of, of, of what we think we can achieve on the network over the long term, allowing us to, uh, to, to reinvest many of those savings in both, in both attracting more riders with, with, a, with more competitive fares and also reinvesting in the systems that are being um, operated. Um, I won't dw dwell on the freight opportunities here, but in many of these corridors where we have passenger trains, we have major trade corridor improvements that are happening alongside the passenger rail improvements. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, investments in terminal and yard capacity and other things that are necessary to keep California connected to the rest of the nation and its ports competitive. And, uh, and those freight investments uh, really are in parallel with many of the, rail and the passenger rail investments um, as, we, as we move forward. Um, I, I won't dwell on this slide in much detail either, but just to give a sense of how California does it, I've kind of developed these two slides that talk about all the different sources we have for transit and uh, in rail in the state. Um, it's, it's quite a mix of, of different funding sources. And recently, um, this last summer, you know, this last spring in passing SB1, the state of California added $5 billion a year to its transportation funding um, statewide. A, a good chunk of that goes into transit and, uh, and rail investments. About a billion dollars a year of the $5 billion is eligible for public transit investments. Um, as well as inner city rail. And this is really that, that, that additional, those additional revenue streams and how they, how they are used in the uh, transit and rail environment. The, the diesel sales and use tax is a major funding source, both historically and going forward. Um, the, uh, the, the vehicle license fee um, that, is, that is paid on your registration is, is a major part of our capital funding going forward, as is the cap and trade revenue that we have in the state that goes to transit. So in the near term, what are we doing? We're really focused on this transit rail integration. We're making a lot of the soft side investments, including in fare integration um, and, and, and mobile ticketing that could be rolled out statewide, um, focus on improving the existing services and customer experience, and then really doing our planning with this long range vision in mind. Um, so here, we're, you know, our next steps are to release the final state rail plan um, to program new funding. Um, we have a, this new source, half percent of the sales tax, of the diesel sales tax going to state rail assistance. Um, that's, uh, we're programming three years of that right now um, by, by January of 2018. Our, uh, our STIP has been strengthened through the new revenue streams. And then the Transit Intercity Rail Capital Program has about a $2.4 billion competitive uh, pot that's on the street right now. We're getting applications in January for that, and we'll be making awards um, by April. So those are some of the things we're doing in the near term and then a focus on our detailed planning. So I'll leave it at that. 
Well, good morning. I'm Beth McCluskey. I'm happy to be here today addressing you as a the newly elected, I guess, um, chair of MIPRC. And we are the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of us, so I'm going to go through uh, a few introductory slides. So what is MIPRC? Well, here's our purpose through our member states and partners to promote, coordinate, and support passenger rail service improvements through development and implementation of plans and improvements, advocacy for the Midwestern interests, support our state department of transportation's plans, and be an active participant in the FRA-led regional planning efforts. So our states are going to be shown on a few of these, these maps coming up. Um, but the important thing about MIPRC is that there are some unique attributes of the compact that we work under. We can supplement the state's abilities. We're well, well suited to facilitate collective action, especially to implement and provide oversight for specific rail projects. So this is something we've really taken advantage of as the State Departments of Transportation especially when we are very constrained by what we can do in terms, so an example would be our locomotives. We want to be able to lease our locomotives to other properties. I'm sure, I don't know if anyone is in here from MBTA. We're speaking with MBTA on, on Friday, actually. We've got excess locomotives that we'd like to lease to them. Now, seeing as those were bought through the DOT, um, we're very challenged, and if we lease them, how do we retain the funds? How do we set up anything like that? Well, MIRPRC is, is an entity that can do that for us. Um, all state DOTs have a general revenue fund, and so if, say, IDOT, Illinois DOT, wanted to set up its own separate bank and make sure that we retained those funds, we couldn't do that. It would go back to the general revenue fund and it would be very complicated. And we want to make sure that since we got a federal grant for that equipment, that we can keep kind of a, a revolving fund that, you know, for perpetuity, we can make sure that that investment is going to the Midwest states. It's not getting sucked back into Illinois just the state of Illinois. Um, so things like that. So, so MIPRIC is, it has some unique attributes that are really helpful to the state DOTs. We do convene once a year for an annual meeting in the fall, and then in the spring, we also do a legislative outreach in DC here. So here's our region, here's all of our states, and this map is showing our long distance routes, the Amtrak long distance routes. The 10-year growth has been about 16% on these long-distance routes, of which eight serve the Midwest, all or originating out of our nation's rail hub in Chicago. And these routes have 80 station stops across the Midwest, many of them traversing a diverse landscape of rural communities that are not served by any other forms of inner city transportation. Here's our state-supported routes. Uh, this is our, our bread and butter. In addition to the long-distance routes, several states pay for service frequencies on the shorter distance corridors. Since PREA in 2009, any passenger rail service of less than 750 miles from start to end point must be paid for by the states. So the Midwest now has nine of those routes. The 10-year growth has been at about 42 percent. Illinois is one of these, and we're hovering at about $50 million per year for this investment for our passengers. And what is the end game? Really quickly, the, the build out of the Midwest Regional Rail Service with increasing service frequencies, providing new routes, and decreasing travel times is kind of the end game. And it's a combination of the state supported services, the long distance routes, and future routes. And over the past 20 years, the Midwest state DOTs have worked together to implement a plan to, to do this. So, so this is it, but it's evolving. And I'm going to have one more slide on kind of the origin uh, before we get to where we're going now. So where did we start? Uh, the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative was developed in 1996, so over 20 years in the making. Uh, nine state departments of transportation, as well as the FRA and Amtrak, worked on this through a memorandum of understanding. So the detail of what has transpired since the implementation is what we're experiencing now. We've got the development of the plan, we've got the ridership, we've got the executive plan, the economic in impact analysis, and the implementation which is ongoing, and I'll get into 
right now. So then we got some funding. And that, of course, enables the accomplishments. So between federal fiscal years 09 and 11, you know that Congress appropriated more than $10 billion in federal funding to the states for passenger rail capital improvements and planning. And the Midwest got $2.5 billion. So with 25% of the nationwide funding, the Midwest was able to embark upon a high-speed rail network beyond what was possible for decades. Most of, those, most of those dollars are being concentrated on four key corridors, and that's the Chicago to St. Louis to Kansas City route, Minneapolis, St. Paul to Chicago, Chicago to Quad Cities, and Detroit Pontiac to Chicago. More details on that. What we're actually working on. So with those funds, um, we, we're busy. We have four main areas. We've got the equipment purchases and deliveries. We've got the implementation of the projects. We've got the rail studies for the future. And we've got advocacy going on with action items. And I'll explain that. So first, our equipment purchases and deliveries. Um, we did, I know that everyone has read about the chargers. They are, it's our biggest achievement. It's the, been the one that's the most publicized. Um, is that. The equipment purchase as a whole, very positive press on the locomotives, lots of inquiries on where are the passenger cars. And the locomotives are from Siemens. They are currently being delivered and they're in service as well. They look great, they're clean environmentally, and they're fast, and they have all the bells and whistles slash requirements. And the passenger cars, at long last, we can talk about it. They are going to be delivered. Uh, well, California is the lead in, in this procurement, uh, but we are going with a single level car, and Siemens is going to be producing them. And we're excited about that. We're, we're having some final meetings actually this week. My team is in Sacramento right now. Um, we're working with stakeholders. We're looking forward to a real kickoff so that we can soon share some more good news about the future delivery and utilization and enjoyment of these cars for our passengers in the Midwest. So the other funds. Here is a smattering of improvements made possible with those months. Almost all of the states benefited in some way. Uh, I'm most familiar, of course, with the Illinois project, the Chicago to St. Louis high-speed rail project. We are over 90% complete. Uh, we are continually challenged, as is most people in the room, with PTC and having that uh, priority for our, our partners to get that done. Uh, but we've got station openings. We actually have one next week and one the week after. We've got um, on-time performance and reliability. We've got track renewals, sidings, uh, signals and crossings improvements. And that's the, one of the photos there, the top photo, is one of our crossing improvements. And we've got a bridge renewal on the bottom. So you can see, though, Indiana got their gateway project. Iowa had some crossovers and an EIS. Michigan did an acquisition and improvements from Kalamazoo to Dearborn, along with stations. Minnesota did the Twin Cities to Chicago EIS and the Northern Lights Express Service. Missouri did a whole bunch. And these are they had at least three more that I had to take off the slide. Um, but, but the big one is the third main line uh, in St. Louis on the TRRA. And Wisconsin as well. They did some crossover improvements and, and Mitchell Airport platform. And Wisconsin, is, it's interesting, and I don't know, some people know this. So they gave back some funds, and they had uh, team members that didn't know what they were going to do. So I am really lucky that um, my deputy for railroads came to us from Wisconsin DOT. He's been with us now, I think, six or seven years. And some of you in the room know him, John Oymon. He's, he's a fantastic employee, a fantastic manager, and we're lucky to have him. So we're also planning for the future. In 2012, MIPRC requested that you know, FRA would help us with our passenger rail development, with our plans. And in 2014, when the call for statements of interest came out, we submitted that. And in 2015, we were chosen, along with the Southeast. So the goal here is to produce a 40-year framework for the Midwest inner city passenger rail network, including a prioritization of corridors and investments, governance structure, and a funding strategy. This includes 12 Midwestern states and, and MIPRC as lead stakeholders. So we have been meeting um, for about, I would say, 16 months. And we're wrapping up, actually, next week in Chicago. Um, we're getting some kind of 
final thoughts on, on where this is, is going. But we've got other things going on too. There's other ongoing studies. There's Chicago to Detroit EIS, Chicago to Milwaukee EA, the Chicago Terminal Zone Study, uh, the Midwest Regional Rail Planning Study, and the Twin Cities to Milwaukee Chicago Study. Um, I have to point out too, there are, there are things that are not out on this slide. There's some grassroots initiatives. There's a mix of private funds and public funds. Um, you know, Indiana, I'm sure we're going to hear more about what they're doing um, in the near future. And we really look forward to, to all of the states progressing. And it's just, it's very encouraging that we're not all waiting on federal funds to do so. There's a lot of initiatives that are progressing just based on the, the interest of the states. So, securing our future, I'd, I'd like to echo somebody said earlier that we need to be a loud and united voice. This is definitely something that we are striving to do. I would also like to echo that partnerships are really important and the advocacy that APTA can, can lead us with is going to be really important uh, for the future as well. But we need to reemphasize the strong partnerships at the federal level. We, we need to have federal support. We can't do it w without. Um, we need to develop an enduring collaboration with the states for passenger rail development and implementation, implementation that's similar to the other modes. Uh, the Midwest needs to be a priority. That that's the bottom line. Um, you know, I'm, this slide shows shows a few different things going on here. You know, the last the last one is more about elevating our profile and kind of insisting on interaction that maybe we didn't have in the past. Um, I don't have the challenges here and the lessons learned um, on my slide, but I, I will speak to them, especially probably in the question and answer. Um, but everything we do is about partnerships, it's about our passengers. And we need to do those together. They're, we're all stakeholders in moving everyone around. However, sometimes, your partners disappoint you and your partners take too long to do things and we want to be, MIPRC wants to be out there saying, okay, if you're going to move this direction, we can help. Here's what we've learned. Here's how you have to approach Amtrak. Here's how you have to approach, and Caroline is, Caroline is fantastic. Um, but you know, the, the biggest problems there is there's, there's an uncoordinated approach. I am the, <laughs> I'm working at an executive level and so is she. And what her and I talk about is not going to be translated to the operational folks. And you know, just, I was telling someone this last week, I can't make a, a cultural change, though I would love to. I, I took a train from Chicago to Springfield last week, and you know I had I had my badge on that says you know Amtrak train inspector, which is a, is a little stretch, but I had it on, <laughs> and I identified myself as the state DOT person, and so one of the engineers or conductors came and spoke with me about the charger locomotives, and he was like, well. I don't know who designed them because if the engine is running, you can't just like walk back through. And I'm like, well, I'm thinking that's probably a safety factor. He's like, well, and another thing, how about the window design? And I was like, okay, that's almost a $5 million present. You were driving a 1980 El Camino. I bought you a Range Rover. Please, let's move forward and let's embrace new technology and everything else. And it's just those type of things are what we're, we're very much like struggling with. Well, I mean, apologies to those who still love the El Camino. <laughs> um, but so it's, it's really interesting and the, the cultural shift has, has been really hard. We really thought that everybody would just be so excited about these new chargers running on the line. And we know now there's going to have to be some early and often outreach and all kinds of, all kinds of interaction with the operational folks, especially when we get the new cars. So um, yeah, so it, it's, been a, it's been a big thing. But um, that pretty much concludes what MIPRC is doing. And we are continuing to, to implement, we're continuing to advocate for our passenger rail future in the Midwest. And we look forward to partnering with all of you. Thanks. Good morning. 
Um, it, it's great to be here. I, w I want to start by saying it's a, a little bit of a, how do you say it, a, a, a homecoming uh, with, with uh, Ray Chambers here and Bob Babbitt and Art Gazzetti. I, I will happily date myself, but t 20 years ago, this, this in 1997 is when I stumbled into the passenger transportation world when I uh, took a job with former Congressman Bob Clement, who was from Nashville. Uh, Ray was working with Bob and Spencer Bacchus on the inclusion of a RIF provision in the uh, surface transportation bill, which was successful. Bob Babbitt was the head of the uh, um, Nashville MTA, and we were working on the establishment of a new commuter rail line, which is in operation and growing year over year. And Art Gazzetti and I worked together uh, very closely as we were pushing forward on, 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 on the Nashville commuter rail line and realized that the CSX railroad was really not as eager as we were, uh, we began to consider what kind of legislative options we might have to employ to encourage our freight railroad friends to come to the table. Not a lot's changed in 20 years, um, but, but a lot has. And so I, I want to, I'm going to go through this quickly because I know really the, the most meaningful part of, of any of these discussions are the, are the Q&A. And um, so I, I just have a list, and this will just help me as, as we go, uh, as I go through a, a couple of key issues uh, in terms of what's been happening at, at Amtrak. Certainly working with our partners, uh, it's great to see Beth and Chad. I, I was in Wichita, I think a, a few weeks ago for the MIPRIC meeting. Uh, Wichita is, is very eager to become part of the um, state corridor network and uh, a lot of interest, a lot of demand. And when you're really looking at the inner, the, the, the connectivity of, of the entire network, there are so many opportunities and that's why I, uh, I'm just taking a of notes during Chad's discussion is about sort of the integration of everything. So I think that's what, I mean, that's what people, that's what passengers expect. You know, it's, it's first, last mile, everything in between the frequency and the reliability. And if, if we can't do that, um, well, then, then we are just, we are going to struggle. Um, so let me first of all, and Dick sort of stole my thunder, and I don't usually have a lot of props. But um, this was the press release that Amtrak issued a couple of weeks ago um, that uh, basically said Amtrak sets re re ridership revenue and earnings records, solid results de delivered in 2017. And it's incremental, right? These aren't double digit numbers. Um, but this is on existing infrastructure with existing equipment and doing everything we can to increase ridership. Um, the, the real story, and that's where I want to sort of t talk about the states, and I'll, I've highlighted on this chart the, um, the state corridors. Because when you look at what's happened um, in the last, well, this, this goes back to 1998 but just the incredible growth on, on the state corridors and also significant growth on long distance and, and certainly on the Northeast Corridor. But what's happened in the states because of the innovation, the persistence, the drive, states like Illinois, states like California, where there is such enormous opportunity. And clearly, you know, there's every indication that the more we can partner, the more we can collaborate, there is enormous room for more growth and every reason to believe that those trend lines should continue to grow. Uh, this is just another way of slicing and dicing, and it's very pretty. I didn't do this. Someone else that's much more talented than I, but you're looking at all of the state corridors. Again, everything trending in the right direction. Uh, this is on the Northeast Corridor. So uh, many of you may be frequent travelers. Um, when you look at what's happened since the introduction of Acela in 2000, in terms of market share um, with uh, airline com competition, and going forward into uh, 2021 when we will launch the next generation of Acela train sets, which will provide 40% more capacity. Uh, we will have half-hour train service out of 
of, uh, out of Washington to New York. And we're building these in Hornell in, in New York. I mean, this is Alstom. We are partnering with Alstom for the production of the train sets. Um, but this is, this is going to be uh, an exciting time over the next several years as we bring these into service and um, will be really sort of the, the, the next phase of, of high-speed rail in the United States. No doubt we have a long way to go, and it's, it's, it's great that we're joined by so many of our international partners. Um, so much to learn from them, um, and and um, but what we f absolutely feel very 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 positive about the steps that we're taking there. Not just on the equipment, but I think as many of you know, the RIF loan will also support uh, in infrastructure investments to better articulate the train sets to the to the equipment. Um, on our Amfleet ones, and many of you are familiar with them, they um, we have gotten our money's worth out of uh, out of the Amfleets. The Amfleet ones are are going through a refresh. We um, we're going to be replacing all of the seats, all of the carpeting. Um, it, it, it's a pretty major facelift for for these cars, and something that again, when you talk about the customer experience and what customers expect when they get on a train, uh, it's go it's going to feel more modern and newer and cleaner. And there's going to be a, an increased focus. You're going to hear more about this, and I'll speak about this as I as I close out today, about what we are doing to 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 enhance and greatly improve the customer experience uh, across our network. Um, Karen mentioned this in our, in our discussion the other day, and, and, and we don't have the time to go through this in great depth, and, and I don't mean to single out, you know, when you look at the asset replacement needs for Amtrak um, on the infrastructure that we own, the equipment that we own, the needs across the, the system on which we operate, much of which obviously we do not own. But clearly, in terms of tip of the spear, when you look at the urgency of needs, the, the assets on the Northeast Corridor, where 800,000 passengers a day rely on Amtrak, are in desperate need of replacement. And, uh, I, you know, I, I was talking to Leonard Parker earlier about this, that, you know, there's no, no doubt, there, there's generally a consensus. There's a consensus that something has to be done. But in, in my estimation, we, we need to turn up the rhetoric in a very big way, because the, the, the clock is ticking. There, there, this is not, these projects, and, and I think as you know, or you may not know, uh, the Gateway program is a sort of a collection of projects. There isn't, you know, there isn't one distinct project. There, there are several. Now, some are more urgent than others. Um, certainly, the Hudson River Tunnel replacement, Portal Bridge, are, are at the top of the list. But there are, are a number of other projects that ultimately, it's not just about replacement. It's about capacity, providing important redundancy, improving the ride quality. We have two tracks going into New, going into New York from, from New Jersey. We need four tracks there, you know, two tracks. There's such a bottleneck. So, um, so going into the new year, um, f for sure, there, we are going to have to, working together with our partners, with, with all interested parties, really turn up, I think, the, the, the discussion and, and the heat on, on Gateway and how we're going to identify and secure long-term funding to, to um, move those projects forward. On-time performance, um, I, I don't think any discussion, it, you, you can't have a full discussion without talking about what is happening in terms of the reliability across the network. And this has plagued Amtrak for for our entire existence, right? So we, we, I don't want to have a dissertation about sort of where we've been, where we are, what is preference, what the Supreme Court, the metrics and standards that were stricken, all of that. What matters is that from a day-to-day -day basis, people that are getting on our trains, whether they're state trains, they're long-distance trains, they need to know with a fair degree of certainty that the, t the time that they're promised to arrive at their destination is the time that they will arrive. And, and, and right now, I think year to date, I mean, we're only, we're in November, we're at about 50% on time across the national network, which is embarrassing. And so, um, look, you know, we've tried legislative remedies. I helped write legislative remedies. They were stricken down. We've been sued. The AAR takes us to court. 
I don't know what the solution is, but I can guarantee that you're going to hear a lot more about this in 2018. We have new leadership. Our new leadership is, is really you know, struggling to understand w why we're here, but we're going to do everything we can to reverse these patterns. And uh, I know our state partners are frustrated. We are frustrated. Our passengers are frustrated. Our customers. And, and there's nothing worse for, for the brand than when a customer is on a train that is two, three, four, five hours late. So uh, again, many of you are very familiar with the history, and, and I don't want to turn this into an entire discussion about on-time performance. Um, I'll, uh, I'll briefly mention appropriations, because as, as everyone here knows, Amtrak relies on, on a federal funding um, for our operational support and certainly our capital investment. We've made tremendous progress in terms of reducing the, um, the, the number, the, the federal requirement for our operating support, and we're going to continue to work on that. Our CEO has indicated we are on path and have a goal of a break-even operating loss by 2019. So we're going to be very aggressive uh, pushing that. For FY18, as you know, we're in a CR. Um, generally, we're at a, around flat funding from FY17 with mo modest increases in both the House and the Senate, which is a good story. And, and the good news is that if you, if you look at funding generally for the last five, seven years, there, there's a fair degree of certainty. There isn't a lot of volatility. We haven't gotten huge swings upwards, but we also haven't been dramatically cut. So our view is you know, we, we need to move from an era of what's going to happen, will Amtrak get funding, to say, this is, you know, this is our baseline, and let's plan. Let's build our plan based on that, knowing full well we need about $38 billion in, in additional capital funding for major asset replacement. But in terms of baseline needs, we're, we're in pretty good shape. So I'll close, because then I know we want to do questions and, and, um, and, and uh, answers. But um, we have a new CEO, Richard Anderson, who was the longtime CEO of Delta Airlines, um, comes uh, to Amtrak really um, underscoring these three areas, safety and efficiency, customer service, and investing in our assets. He, um, uh, you know, he's only been on the job, I mean, going on six months. But there is is a major uh, a, a major effort underway, um, not just for our frontline employees, but for all employees, focused on customer experience, um, doubling down on that for all of us. And um, it, it, I'm not going to go into sort of the details of that, but you rest assured you're going to hear more about that um, it, going forward. And uh, it, and additionally, just doing everything we can on the asset side to make as strong a case possible about the, the requirements that are needed. Yes, we're in an environment where there's a lot of discussion about public-private partnerships, private equity, interest in funding infrastructure. Most of our assets just don't fall into those categories. And so we continue to do everything we can at, with DOT and on the Hill. I know you, you'll hear from them later to make the case for the, the federal need to make those investments. And I think I'm about done now, Eric. So thank you very much. Well, that, those were all fantastic. Uh, Kyle, will you come join us, please? That's great. Um, you know, we've been at this for, as uh, Caroline mentioned, 20 and more years. In fact, there was a study back in the 1964, I think, was when we first started thinking about um, high-speed rail in the United States. And it's amazing that over time, so much energy and effort has been expended. And I think we've arrived at a point now where we're not talking about uh, whether Amtrak gets uh, federal support or get state support. We're talking about how much that support should be. So it's a really tremendous climate change in that regard. Um, but the question going forward is, uh, do we have the energy and do we have the will to uh, actually implement the plans that have been outlined here this morning and other uh, uh, visionary notions that people have? Um, 
so in that regard, I'd like each of you to address that matter of where is the where is the driving force going to come from within each of your organizations to see that the 2040 plan for California and for the Midwest and the like is really implemented and that we see um, through that effort an acceleration to reaching that tipping point in a, in a very reasonable uh, uh, time period. Caroline, you want to start first? Hello, can you, uh, uh, well, Certainly, uh, and as I just mentioned, we have new leadership at Amtrak. Our, our new CEO has made it clear that, one, we are going to be very aggressive on our capital spend program, which, again, it's no secret that if, if, if you look at um, the trends there, we, we, have, we have not, year over year, been able to get as much of our capital funding out the door as we need to. It's going to be very aggressive on that front, because certainly on the Northeast Corridor, um, beyond the major asset replacement, there is work and we've got the funding and we need to be aggressive and move forward on that. So so there's that. We are also going to be moving forward on a new 10-year fleet plan. And um, similarly, uh, under the FAST Act, I mean, there are a number of planning requirements, including five-year service line and asset plans that are, so they're federally mandated, but we are, we are working on those as well. So there's, um, and, and in our new organization, we have a new, I think Byron Kamadi is speaking here later today, our new vice, relatively new vice president of planning. So, so there, you know, there is a lot of activity underway under our, our new leadership. There's been a, a, a reorganization, I think, as you know, of the company, and um, certainly just a, a laser focus on on delivering on the commitments that we make and making sure that we continue to make as strong a case as possible we can to our funders. This summer at New York Penn Station, we had, uh, w was an example of a, a situation where we had a major infrastructure need that um, uh, we had to address quickly. We developed the plan, we executed, we did that on time, did it safely, and we um, think it was a good lesson learned for us about when you have a plan and you execute to the plan under good leadership, that um, there are there are positive results at the end of that. Yes. Uh, so I have a few thoughts. Um, one, we need to really address the mixed freight and passenger environment in a meaningful way. Um, Illinois DOT this last month, um, we applied for an infra grant to fix the 75th Street CIP. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with that. It's part of our CREATE program. Our CREATE program is a $4.4 billion program of projects, uh, and that, that price tag keeps growing. But this is just one step that can, can really enhance Amtrak's ability to move in and out of the Chicago terminal. So, so we're doing that. We're doing that as a partnership. Um, but our ultimate goal from the MIPRC perspective is inclusion. Um, we want to be considered as, we want a primary consideration as a partner. Um, we pay quite a bit. The states pay quite a bit for the supported services, and yet we don't see any share of Amtrak's capital plan. We know all about the Northeast Corridor because it is always the priority. Um, and that is, it, it's a source of frustration for us, and it's something that we want to address more fully in the future, and we're going to have to do that through, yeah, extreme advocacy and better relationship building and better understanding and just a continual emphasis that we pay and we should get a say. And um, th that's going to be our challenge. <laughs> So uh, in California, I think we're, we're in a very happy place right now. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, legislation and politics, we've had a great deal of support from the State Assembly. Um, uh, you know, laws being passed, uh, but more importantly, as Chad mentioned, Senate Bill 1, the, the $5.5 billion a year funding package, of which $750 million is going to go to transit and rail as a minimum per year over the next 10 years. And then it, and it, the bill should live on if, it, if we can defeat some of the uh, um, recall efforts that might be coming up next year. It is California, after all. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but really, the, the, uh, the political atmosphere is, is investment right now. Um, the, the, the people in, Cal in Sacramento uh, and, and local uh, council members and, and mayors really do believe in investing in, in alternative transportation and, and alternatives to congestion. Um, climate change is also something that California, I think in general, the public, but especially the politicians, really do understand the threat that that is, is, is creating. Uh, we've taken huge steps to reduce greenhouse 
greenhouse gas emissions, but um, greenhouse gas from transportation continues to increase. So I think that's going to help us kind of redouble our efforts from Caltrans and from the High Speed Rail Authority to point out that we have an opportunity to really drive down um, transportation contribution to, uh, to greenhouse gas. <clears throat> We're, we're also uh, improving our relationship with the host railroads. I think we've, we've, got, we've grown by leaps and bounds with BNSF and Union Pacific in the last few years, um, working really creatively with them on new approaches to uh, access and, and service planning in a way that benefits passenger and, uh, and freight railroads as well. And we're hoping to get them involved in some of these, uh, some of these grant programs that are coming through the new SB1 package as well. Uh, and then I think really just congestion and growth are two factors that face Californians every day. And, and to me, when we talk about the idea of the rail plan vision hel helping inner city and commuter rail grow from a half percent of total VMT or total passenger miles traveled in the state to almost 6 percent, it's something that appeals. It's almost, it's, it's motherhood and apple pie when we go around and get these presentations. Everybody says, well, yeah, why aren't we doing this? And so with the gubernatorial campaign heating up, we'll have Jerry Brown's term ends at the end of uh, 2018. Uh, I think with a vision like that and with the support we're getting, I, I think we're really going to be able to make uh, rail and mass transportation and first last mile solutions a, gov uh, a gubernatorial campaign topic. And I think that's really going to roll into the next election. So we have just a few minutes left. Um, is there an insightful question or two that you all would like to ask? Ross? Um, too many things and then one that may be insightful. Uh, when Chad said uh, efficiency included changes in travel distances. I assume he was talking increase the in travel distance. And the uh, and the other mini question is uh, that Beth referred to station openings, one next week and one the following week. Uh, and I just want to know what those are, what those are. And the and the bigger question is you mentioned Indiana got their gateway project. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? I can definitely tell you the station openings. Uh, Lincoln Station is next week, and then after that, it's Carlinville. Uh, and that completes all of the stations along the Chicago to St. Louis high-speed rail line uh, that we have been responsible for. Um, in terms of the Indiana Gateway, I'm sorry, I do not know enough about that, but I can definitely point you to somebody who can answer more of your questions on that. Thank you. Mark? Beth, uh, kudos for getting South Dakota to join the uh, group. I was curious, what was their agenda or interest in uh, uh, joining the group? Another question I really cannot answer. Um, I would have to point you to Laura Cleaver, who is our, our staff to, to MIPRC, and her outreach to them. But yes, they have been very interested. They came and did our legislative outreach day in, in DC. Um, they want to be part of the network, as do all of the states that are in the network. We all want to expand our network. So it's just it's a nice synergy for all of us working together. And I don't know their particular motivations, but I'm sure we can dig into that. Thank you. Down here. Can we get him a microphone? Hi, Ruben Vabner. Uh, the question is for California. Uh, I would assume there's a, quite a push to increase federal involvement going forward. There has been federal money in the past, uh, up till now. But in, in terms of grants and loans, I imagine that's part of the reason Chad has a 10 o'clock me meeting. Is, is, it, is there a big push to bring in fe more federal money? Because the state is working awfully hard at this point yeah. to make this happen. Well, I, th I think at this point, uh, at least I I've been in California for a year after coming out from the FRA. And <laughs> I think the sense that I get is, is, is that for now, we're trying to go our own or be able to pre prepare to be able to go on our own without support from Washington. We, we want to plan in a way where we can uh, welcome and be ready for federal dollars when they return. Uh, but in addition to the state dollars, there's also a significant number of counties in California are self-help counties. And so when we're looking at projects on the regional commuter systems, uh, these, these projects to integrate transit with rail. Um, we are talking uh, LA County, I, I believe uh, their measure M is, is, is in the hundreds of billions of dollars over 30 or 40 years. Um, so, it's, so it's not just the state money, it's also local money. Uh, and we're finally beginning to see um, private participation in the high-speed rail project as well. A lot of those benefits, a lot of the interest for the private sector in high-speed rail uh, are, it, are just going to come later <laughs> in the project, but we're starting to see those first sparks. And that's going to start, I think, to help us tell a better story um, that we haven't been able to tell in the press. But the federal money, we, we certainly look forward to it returning, but we're going to try to go it on our own as much as we can for now. 
Great, thank you. So uh, we've got time for one more question, Al. Well, first of all, my compliments to all the panelists. You laid a great foundation for this forum and you set a very high bar for the rest of the day here. So you did a great job. Now, while we're talking about federal money, two years ago this week, there was a lot going on on the Hill. Uh, the Surface Transportation Act was in play and we reached a major milestone. We got a rail title into the bill for the first time but no dedicated funding, still general funding. So my question to all of you is, what's being done now to plan for reauthorization? How are we going to build on this rail title? Do you have any strategies for moving to some kind of a dedicated uh, funding strategy? But Amtrak was also authorized for the you know, first time in many years for, for multiple years. No, I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a first jab at it and, and pass it down. Beth and Kyle, it, no, it, it was a milestone, absolutely, that rail and Amtrak authorization were included in the FAST Act. It, it, it is true there is no funding, and so now um, we, we need to turn, we've got three years left in the bill, but as we all know, next year we're going to begin the discussion about FAST Act reauthorization, and that's when we need to <coughs> unite it and in partnership and collaboration. Um, st start to chart that path forward because it's it's incredibly complicated. There, um, you know, there, the trust fund is broken. Never, never mind, you know, never mind finding funding, you, you know, for inner city passenger rail. Exist the existing funding sources are inadequate. So again, I'll I'll I'll, I'll echo what Beth said, echoing Dick from earlier. You know, loud and united, you know, and I think working with APTA and other advocacy groups, we we've got to we've got to help identify those solutions. But I don't know the answer to that. I don't think any of us know the answer, but I think um, we're in a good place. We can show we we have evidence of the investments that we've made. We have evidence of the utilization that's out there. We're going to need to band together. You know, right now under the CR. We have less money than we expected. There are three programs that were never even authorized at this point that we're kind of waiting for. Um, they are not at the highest levels, but we still want access. We, we still want to be able to apply for them, and we have not been given that opportunity as of yet. And um, yeah, I, I think that during the, the next few years, it, that's, it's going to be a loud and united voice from, from all of us probably in this room on, on that very issue. Kyle. I don't have much to add, I, I, other than uh, funding flexibility is going to be key, especially as we're really looking at multimodal solutions, working with freight railroads, being able to flex um, rail and highway projects and really think about things about moving people, not moving cars or moving trains. Um, that's something California would certainly support. Good. Please join me in thanking this great panel.